Hello and welcome to the international edition of Fifth Wrist Radio. Fifth Wrist Radio's podcasts and the website fifthwrist.com are from the community for the community. Honest reviews and podcasts from and for watch enthusiasts. International edition today because we are on site and we are conducting an interview in German, of course with an English dubbing. And we've got something very special today. Our guest is the universal scholar and one of the great watch geniuses of our time, Dr. Ludwig Oechslin. Hi, I'm Adam, Medium Watch, and I'm here to provide the voice of Professor Ludwig Oechslin. Professor Oechslin met with Klaus to discuss everything he's done at Oxen Jr. They originally spoke in German, as that's both their native languages, and met in person when Klaus took delivery of his day-night watch. We were fortunate enough to be able to record this conversation, and we'll hope that you enjoy listening to this translated version of it. So, without further ado, let us hear the interview. Bei diesem Podcast starten wir immer mit. We always start these podcasts with a wrist check, such as. What do we have on our wrists? Uh -huh. If I may, very impolite start, I have my brand new Oxen Junior Day Night, which I call my own for, don't know, maybe 30 minutes. <laughs> This is obvious. Uh -huh. okay. What do you have around your wrist? Well, I have some kind of moon phase watch with sun display and stuff on my arm. A moon phase watch with a sun display. Yeah, yeah, this is so. Yes, it's a sun, which runs around in 24 hours. Okay. And there's also a moon illumination above the sun. And in the moon illumination, there's a circle. And this is the moon. And depending on how much of the circle is in the moon illumination, the more the moon is lit. Oh, okay. And when he is off the sun, he is, of course, fully lit. And when he's above the sun, it's a new moon and not lit. This you can see here. And also, you see where on the sky the sun is. Because the sun is, of course, adjusted to the position of the hands. This is kind of mixture between the day and night on my wrist. No, the day-night basically shows the same, but with a different design. And without the day-night, without the sunrise and sunset. We have, I don't know if you remember, we have once met on the Basel world. Your ticket Maybe. didn't work. I did see you and I have taken the opportunity to trade in my ticket against the selfie with you. I was finished with the show. And I think this watch was already on your wrist on that day. That's possible. I've later zoomed into the picture, factor 100, to see the watch, but I didn't recognize it. Well, this is my favorite watch, and I built it for myself. Will this watch be available sometime? Uh, I, so, yeah. mm -hmm. I believe so, sometime. <laughs> well, in any case, it's in the pipeline, I think. In fall it's in the pipeline, I think. This was, of course, the background of my curious question. Uh -huh. okay. I've also seen a picture of this watch on Instagram. Someone owns this watch already, I think. Is that possible? Yes, they were once delivered to people, kind of exclusively, to try. I'm not sure how to put that question. If you develop a watch, such as the one on your wrist, do you first ask yourself, I have a mathematical idea, how do I make a watch out of this? Or do you say to yourself, I would like to make a watch where the sun shines on the moon and this should be shown in the center of the watch, like on your watch now? How does something like this happen? How can I imagine this as a layman? With this watch, I have a friend called Paul Widmer. He makes fire and iron sculptures in a relatively large size. I've worked together with him to make watches. There were nine models, and each represents one step of the evolution of watches, artistically designed according to my concept. This went on, and I somehow got old tower clocks, and we thought we could also make something out of that. And then he made a piece of art out of it. And I made a watch display, which he designed, of course, and I did the conceptual work. And one of these concepts has namely been to let the sun revolve in 24 hours and the moon a little slower, to show on a disk in the background also how the moon is lit by the sun. Based on this design, this watch has later been developed. 
Ja. Die ist auch flacher als. This watch is also slimmer than the others, and the case looks slightly different. Yes, You're yes, mainly yes. known right. for the construction of the special movements. But the cases are also amazingly different and more inventive. Ja, nein, also es ist, es ist eben so. Yeah, it's like that. In the past, I created a lot of things for Oxen Jr. Mm -hmm. And there are four movements that I prefer. The first one is the ETA 2824. This is the most common one. Uh -huh. And then there is the ETA 2892. And this is the one that I used when I was developing modules for Elise Nardan watches. Ah, yeah. Elise Nardan has also developed their own movements. The UN 320, which is in your day-night watch, and then also the UN 118, which is what I used in the perpetual calendar. Ah, okay. The concept for the cases is the following. Yeah. The 2824 has its own case, and then the other cases are very similar to it. Uh, for instance, the 2892, it's a little bit slimmer because the 2892 movement is a little slimmer. And then the cases for the Elise Nardan movements have their own characteristics. So there are actually four different cases that are similar and coherent to the movements that are inside. Right, so it's the same fundamental idea. The cases are the same from the underlying concept, with a two-piece case, no movement retaining ring and so on. Exactly, all the same fundamental idea, just small stylistic adjustments that show what kind of movement is in it. I see. And how do you decide that the 320 from UN is in here and in the perpetual calendar another one? Does this have something to do with... Well, that's just with lugs here. Here are... Yeah, right. But how do you decide which one comes in? Why did you choose the 320? Does it have to do something with talk? No, no. No. The most stable one is the 2824. There I built most of my designs. It was about that because um, ETA just started to block uh, the sale of movements and they became difficult to get a hold of. So that's why uh, we have been working with Elise Nardan. Mm -hmm. The UN 118 is a bit bigger and it's got a power reserve indicator and the seconds hand is at a sub dial at six o'clock, whereas the ETA movements all have a seconds hand that's at the center. So this is a completely different construction principle. Ah, okay. To make the perpetual calendar, I used the UN 118. And in a later phase, when the 320 was finished and matured, it was about the size of the ETA calibers, and I was able to work a bit more freely with the 320, even if the second is at six. But at least it didn't have another display at the 12. And these displays are occasionally in the way of modules. Yeah. That's why it's easiest to have the actual date displays from the center and build the others around it. However, if the second display is at six, you still have to take this into account somehow. Yes, mine doesn't have a second hand at all, but I don't really miss it. Colleagues of mine, they buy a watch and they are disappointed two days later because the watch is three seconds off. With the Elise Nardan movements, the big advantage is that the date can be adjusted back and forth, and therefore these are used. Right, and this is of course important for an astronomical watch, where you have to turn sometimes a little bit. Yes, you have to turn a little more. It might be good if you can go back to the next point you need. Yes, I remember. Once I had the perpetual calendar in my hand, and I was allowed to play around with it a bit. According to the motto, there you go, you can't break anything. <laughs> This was really great. But now I remember something important. Normally I don't have to introduce you to a watch enthusiast community like Fifth Wrist, who know a little bit about watches. But of course I should have done that anyway in the beginning, to introduce you as Dr. Ludwig Oechslin. And directly the question, even though you can read this quite often, but you can't really find that much. How did you come to the subject of watches? And what would you have done if it hadn't happened the watch way? Well, what would I have done if I had more success at the beginning of my studies? <laughs> That's the problem. Because I was a bit unhappy after this fifth semester because I really didn't succeed with my studies. Your first degree course was? Greek, Latin, archaeology and ancient history. And in Latin, I really slipped. But in the end, it turned out that it was a subject of bullying in the end. But I didn't realize that at the time. I just thought that maybe I'm smart enough for university, but I have to earn my living. And so I had to think about what else I could do. 
And since I always like to do handicrafts, I thought I could go into the field of fine craftsmanship. Plumbers, or, you know, it's, it's just too rough. So in the end, you end up with watchmaking or goldsmithing. Mm-hmm. And that's what I found out, because there's a lot of interesting theory behind watchmaking. So I decided to go for watchmaking. Fortunately for all of us. Yes, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a story with the, I can't really pronounce it. <laughs> with the Farnese clock. Well, I found a master who accepted me at the age of 23 or 24. Okay which was something that couldn't be taken for granted at the time. And there I did my apprenticeship. To him came someone who obviously discovered this clock in the Vatican Museums and found out that it had no proper publication at all. It had not been described properly. Ah, so it wasn't really known back then. No, it wasn't. Anyways, he finally came to Sporing, the master watchmaker, and looked for a watchmaker who could take the clock apart and describe it. And he wanted that for free. And neither Sporing nor others could afford that. But I looked into it, and as a good archaeologist, I thought to myself at some point, wow, this is crazy. It's like when I, as an archaeologist, was first to dig up the Pantheon. <laughs> yes, it really is an absolutely great clock, and it really is, and has remained so. And he organized it with the Vatican, and when I was there, I took the clock apart. So I put the parts down piece by piece, and uh, the clock's pieces got smaller and smaller, and you know, this mountain of pieces accumulated and got bigger and bigger. For me, it was all systematic. And then he got scared and he disappeared, and I was all alone. And that's why I did the whole thing on my own, and I also published it. And that was when I had finished my first big job. Fascinating. As I said, you kind of read it, but you can't really imagine it. What's also on my list of questions? Now it comes back onto the market, the MIH watch. It will be reissued for those who didn't get it back then. What was your thought process? How did it come to this watch? Yes, well, I work for, for Ulysse Nardan. Ulysse Nardan got me on board, Rolf Schneider. And he guaranteed me, let's say, my livelihood. And that was over 18 or 17 years. And that's then when I became director of the International Museum of Horology. And then at that time, I made these constructions for Rolf Schneider until 2000, when the trilogy and the Sonata came onto the market and so. And the Freak was already, was already part of it. And I have designed much more. So he had all these designs and constructions that he could use for the next 25 or 30 years for Elise Nardan, already in stock for me. So I thought to myself, well, I can stop here, because he doesn't get poor because of that, because he already has all these things on hand for me. <laughs> because I was then the director of the International Museum of Horology, I was not allowed to work in the watch industry or for somebody else. So you had to be independent. Yes, exactly. Only my brain didn't switch off, of course. I continued to construct and build prototypes for myself. And then I came up with an annual calendar with a date and day on one line, which was very important to me, that everything is together. And not spread over the dial all over the place. Exactly. That you can read what the date is all together in one piece. Right. There I created my prototypes in brass. Sorry to interrupt. That means you filed yourself and... Yes, of course. I make all the prototypes myself. Okay. I'm a watchmaker. In the true sense of the word, I make things. And as it was created under the MIH, I presented it to the commission and they wanted to patent it. But of course, that's not possible for a public institution. So they didn't get off the ground. And so I said it in advance, my opinion is that what I have constructed for a public institution is for the public. So it must be made available as open source. So no one can patent it. So they published it, full stop. That means the construction plans are public. The plans, not in themselves, but the construction as a system, is a set of parameters so that everyone can newly construct just that. But the idea itself must be behind it. And that was open source. And at some point, Embassy with Beat Weinman came here and they said they would like to make this watch. And so I said, yes, no problem. It's open source. Why don't you just make the watch? 
This was flattering to me at best, if you think it's that good. But they did not want that. They obviously wanted to take advantage of the reputation of the MIH, and they said, no, we will only do this if it becomes the official watch of the MIH. And out of this, a patronage has been created. Embassy has paid for the production, and there were two points of sale, the MIH and Embassy. And at these two points, the watch was sold, with production costs of 2,900 Swiss francs, and the watch was sold for about 5,000. So 2,100 were left over, and they were divided between the three. If the MIH sold the watch, it got two-thirds, and if Embassy sold the watch, it got two-thirds, and the Eller got one-third. Contracts were drafted by me in such a way that it was clear what these funds had to be used for. Because of cost, I had a functional budget there, but that left me with no resources at all to do basic work. Uh -huh. And to preserve the substance, and that is why these contracts stipulate that they must be used to pay for the restoration of clocks and watches and research and publication of pieces that are part of the collection. Yeah. And thus I had the science in it, the publication. I had the restoration of the pieces of the collection of the MIH. And that is how it came about. Well, the idea has simply developed. First an open source with Embassy, but they also wanted to use our name. So I had to look somehow what I should do, because it's not that easy. Yeah. Because it's open source, but it is not MIH. It was not requested in the publication, but it was asked that if you use this construction, you point out that it was derived from MIH, made available by them. But Embassy wanted it to be the official watch of the MIH, so they could sell it as though it was the official watch. Obviously, this was a selling point, and therefore this deal resulted. You mentioned Ulysses Nardin earlier. What was more exciting, I was wondering? One must also say that there is very much patronage behind this MIH watch. First of all, the MIH itself. Secondly, I have never charged any uh, for my construction. I've never seen a penny. Thirdly, Rolf Schneider waived his rights, which he had after 18 years. And so there's a lot of patronage here. So everybody has to agree. So he still had rights. That it is given to the MIH. And then it had to deal with, and in the end, that is how it came about. And what was more interesting? What did he mean? The Arbeit mit Ulysses Nader, the work with Ulysses Nader, or later to start Oxen Junior as a company? The problem is a different one. It's not about the what's the most interesting. Of course, I've always been a constructor because I never went to schools that hammered anything into me. I always had to invent everything myself and find the solution to the problem myself. And that resulted in completely different things than what is officially taught. Yeah. I made a ton of constructions for Rolf Schneider during the 18 years I worked for him, which were, however, not Ulysses Nardin worthy, because it had to be a bit more complicated, a bit elaborate. And I made a lot of simple constructions, which Rolf simply disregarded, because it was somehow not so interesting for him. On the other hand, I invested much more brains in work in these constructions because they were simplifications, and I already had the interest at some point. I thought to myself that I should actually be able to do this myself. After the MIH watch, I realized that I needed a little more money than the foundation could pay for the 60% that I got as an employee to support my family. And then I could earn a little more with the 40%. And then I talked to the authorities, to my superior, and they said, yes, if it is my own company, then it is possible. But I am not allowed to work for other companies. I am allowed to work for me. And that is what it turned out to be. I wanted to run a sub-company with Rolf at some point, but he wasn't interested in that either. Then Embassy came along, and the cooperation had worked very well there, and over time it developed into the founding of Oxen Jr. And Rolf, for the things that he's not interested in, it is clear that he gives these things away. And with Oxen Jr., I was able to bring the simplified constructions into production. Yes, which of course was great for the watch world, because many fans such as me are fascinated by those simple things. I once took a photo of these 13 parts in my day and night watch lying on the table in the workshop. That is simply super fascinating. And I can't imagine how you come up with it. 
Am meisten habe ich bei der Farnesianischen Uhr gelernt. Yes, well, I mean, I learned most of it at the Farnese clock. First, I had to develop these mathematical theories and formulas to calculate them. Because it had epicyclic gearings, within epicyclic gearings, and another epicyclic gearing on three levels. And to calculate this into each other in a single formula. That did not exist. I really had to reinvent that. It took me about three quarters of a year and I'll have this formula, but that finally resulted in my doctoral thesis. Ach so, das heißt die Dissertation. Ah, that means that your doctoral thesis was about the clock. In which subject was it then? Also, ich persönlich. Well, I personally did my doctorate in theoretical physics, in the field of philosophy and history of the natural sciences. So not with the Farnese clock, not with the four volumes about the Farnese clock. Mm -hmm. And I wanted something additional. And additionally, I have in the appendix developed these theories, these mathematical theories that help me to analyze. But if I go the other way around, I can also construct. And that opened a lot of possibilities for me to find new constructions. Ja, also ich bin Elektroingenieur. Well, I'm an electrical engineer. I can't do anything regarding mechanics. That's why I was so excited that you are making all the prototypes yourself. I can't even get a nail straight into the wall. <laughs> But mathematics are inspiring me. As an electrical engineer, or I used to be an engineer, I'm not anymore. <laughs> That's too long ago. You also do maths. That's why I'm so fascinated by mathematics and how somebody brings mathematics into a 40 mm case is something that fascinates me the most. The mathematics behind it, that's just... I find it sensational. I have another question that came into my mind the other day. The owner of Louis Vuitton, Bernard Arnault, once said that he doesn't do any market research on his products. With all these funny handbags and all the things Louis Vuitton does, He wants to set the trends himself. And, strange enough, because this is a mega corporation, that reminded me of independent watchmakers who say, I don't want to do what I think the market needs. But I have the impression, and that is the question if this is true, that they say, what market research says, what the market wants is not that important to me. I want to do something which I think is right, and then something unique is created. Ja, das ist sicher nicht das Ziel. Yes, that is certainly not the goal. So, if I want to go back to my apprenticeship with Georges Sporting, which I did in Lucerne, I did back some time have to continue my studies. I studied for six years because I did not do the, the official apprenticeship. Ah, okay, that is with interruptions. Yes. Sometime during this period, someone came to me with a perpetual calendar, with a flat perpetual calendar, and told me, yes, This calendar has landed with the seventh watchmaker now, and it still won't go. And obviously, nobody really, well, this was a normal perpetual calendar case with levers, what was left from the 19th century, and it didn't work. And because of this calendar, I had to take a closer look at it and how to reconstruct it. And with this reconstruction, I saw that geometrically certain things did not work. During this time, I realized that when I use this calendar, that it was a really stupid one because if I've gone one day too far, then I have to correct four years to get back to the day, and that's nonsense to me. I cannot set this one one day back, it's just not possible. And then it can still be this issue where if I try to do so, I might break something. Mm -hmm. But there are also subtle calendars from that time that have additional levers in them that don't allow anything to, to break. And they just dodge the issue. Mm -hmm. So they have kind of a safety mechanism so that nothing breaks, but you still can't turn them backwards. Yes, yes. Nothing will be broken. And with this flat watch, I also noticed the levers, because some of them have a, an enormous lever width, but the axis is very small. It is a narrow thing that they always sway a bit back, and they come out of the, the mesh for the activation, and then it doesn't work. So it can be that the geometry is wrong, but it can also have these tolerances, which it must have, so that it can work in all the while the lever and can deviate a little bit, but not too far. And then it does not work anymore. 
What I can say is, this is really bad construction. <laughs> but I, I always wanted a perpetual calendar. I was always incredibly fascinated by a watch that shows the date correctly for a certain eternity. During this time, I already worked in my habilitation with the different priest mechanics, also Philip Matat Han. And in the beginning, when the perpetual calendar was also a topic, so also for watchmakers, there were many other constructions than the usual one, which became general accepted. Amongst others, from Philip Matthias Hahn, there were step transmissions with gear teeth in which one could either pull out or put back in one or several of the gear teeth. And if the gear teeth were in, it did not shift or switch. And if the gear teeth were out, it would shift or switch further. So there were perpetual calendars based on rotation. And I thought, yes, that must be it. Everything that rotates cannot come out of mesh, and above all, you can turn it back. Yeah, yeah. Always because there's a cogwheel or without teeth. And I started to think about what cogwheels with or without teeth, and I don't know what, and then I designed my own calendar. Kurt Klaus also made a simple one, I was told, and did some research. Is that something similar or...? No, no. Because the classic one from IWC is a classic construction with levers and so on. Yes, absolutely. The levers are simply designed differently. <laughs> okay. No, really. It's a classic calendar construction where the levers are differently designed. He actually redesigned it but with different forms of levers. But the system is just the same. Well, it's based on the classical one. I don't want to say old. That sounds yes, negative. Yes, yes, the classic. And many companies are proud that they have many parts that take a long time to assemble. Yes, that is like diamonds. The more and better they are cut, the more they shine. And that's how you can make it more expensive. Exactly. Or at least it can be better marketed. Yes, absolutely. Or you think you can market it better as a classical company. One question, of course, which I actually had for the end. I'm coming to it now because we are talking about these constructions. Is there, without being too pushy, but I'm always curious, is there anything we will see soon from Oxen Junior? So, from the past, I'm now jumping into the present. Well, it's like this. You've seen that I've put a lot of things on their feet, one after the other. What came out in 2002 was actually constructed in 96 or 98. It was in the pipeline, so to speak. And that is, of course, still the case. Without wanting to probe too much, I came across Oxen Junior back then at the Settima Junior. Which one? Settima Junior. What was the name again? The Settimana. Settimana Junior. Yes, exactly. I have to cut that out later because I didn't know the name anymore. Yes, yes, the Settimana Junior. <laughs> <laughs> I say... Yes, this is the watch that brought me to Oxen Junior, and I can't even pronounce it. I found there, although you get a day-date display with every Psycho 5, but this day display, with the dots as a weekday, that has always interested me. I can't say exactly why. Also less out of technical interest, it was just a super beautiful way to display the day of the week. What did you ask? Sorry? <laughs> The underlying question is, of course, does something like this come back again? Ah, the Sedamana. Yeah. I think it would have to be reissued. I think so. Well, I have the impression, and I'm no market researcher, but I could certainly imagine that a lot of people may regard this as great, beautiful, as a starter model, whatever. Yes, yes, that could well be. Only that it is no longer much to do with me. I've already constructed it. <laughs> yes, exactly. But this is, of course, still interesting as the customer sees it after a delay time between the development and what you do today as a company. And what are you working on today? Well, the bigger project I have is a carnival watch. Do you know what carnival is? Yes, yes. I lived in Mainz for a long time and my parents both come from Rottweil. So I do know the Alemannic Carnival. The only real problem is, the only carnival of the world happens in Lucerne. Could not be otherwise. And this carnival begins on Dirty Thursday, five o'clock in the morning with some, some big bang or something. Actually, what I want to build is a watch that lets out the Gokul exactly at five o'clock on Dirty Thursday with a flag that swings. And that's it, so that you see now begins.
So only doing something special once a year. Only once a year. Yes, well, maybe it still has an indicator of a dial or something. But at the end of the day, at five o'clock on a dirty Thursday, the Gokul has to come out and show that the carnival is about to begin. <laughs> yes, well, that is not so easy to solve. Because the Dirty Thursday is the Thursday before Ash Wednesday. And that shifts as Easter does. And Ash Wednesday is dependent on Easter in the calendar. And the Dirty Thursday can also be far away from Easter, i.e. if Easter is very early, it is still in February. So the calendar circuits come in between. So all in all, this is a watch that can, in principle, is to calculate seven algorithms mechanically, but which are not repeated until 5,700,000 years. <laughs> wow, incredible. Well, to calculate the Easter calendar is already difficult, and this calculation was called the computus. The computus is the calculation of the Easter calendar, and what I want to build is such a computus or a computer so nothing actually happens, but it has to deliver to the display at 5 o'clock on Dirty Thursday. Sie erinnern sich, ich hatte am Anfang mal die Frage, was kommt zuerst? You might remember, in the beginning I had the question, which comes first, the mathematical idea or the application? Here the application comes definitely first, and it is as complicated as possible, so that the mathematical idea is really a challenge. Even very extreme. Seven algorithms, did you say? Yes, exactly seven, that have to play into each other. And that's, of course, really something which was never seen before. Yes, they will definitely occupy me in the coming years. Having said that, it is calculated completely in design and everything. I only have to mill and build it. For me personally, I don't know how the listeners will see that later, but for me personally, the whole thing of driving here and conducting this interview was worth it just for this story. I myself don't have a personal relationship with Carnival, but my parents are from the German Carnival town, Rottweil, like Lucerne probably is the Carnival town of Switzerland. So, is there a construction story about my day and night watch? Or a construction information, except that there are 13 parts, I know how it works, but is there something special, any story around it or so? Yes, of course, there's also a story. I mean, to build a watch which shows the sunrise and the sunset time. I thought about that from time to time because it was already built in the Renaissance. So the Renaissance clocks that have astronomical displays have a sunrise and sunset display. But I didn't like it so much as the way they do it with overlapping hoops, etc. And I had other things to do, therefore I let it go. But at some point the challenge came. I had an excellent employee with whom I worked extremely well. And she told me sometime she would be very happy if I had such a watch. And it would be enough for her to have a watch that, at night, would show her roughly how much of the night is over, how much is left, how much of the day she still has available. Just approximately. Mm -hmm. And here I am. Yes, the night is not always the same length, so it's not easy to do something like that quickly. And that's why I came back to the day and night, and it was clear to me that if I make a sun that goes around 24 hours, then it's the day, the whole day with day and night. And when I bring the division of the day, then she has exactly what she wants. Mm -hmm, right. And then I looked up the project for her and started to develop this thing. And she also has one on her arm with sun, but without the moon, just the way she wants it. But that was not quite enough for me, and so I made the moon on top too. <laughs> what I find sensational. When I saw the watch, I'm one of those people, probably like many Oxen Junior customers, who really have to save money for their watch for some time. When I saw the watch, I knew that it must be my next one. Because it does two things. For me, it combines the normal time, that is, the time when I have to keep appointments, when I have meetings, when train goes, when a plane flies. Plus the actual time, the one of the past. I'm not such a super outdoor person anymore, but I used to camp outside with the kids and then by chance there was a lunar eclipse, etc. The actual time, as the farmer used to experience it, who got up with the sun and went to sleep with the sunset, that always fascinated me. I have a friend who actually lives in Germany now, but who lived in Kenya until half a year ago. I asked him, what do you do in the evening down in Kenya? And he said, in the evening? At seven o'clock it makes, the sun sets and we have no electric light. 
We don't do anything. We go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. At that time, I had already ordered the watch, but not on my wrist yet. So I immediately thought of my watch. This combination of nature as it really is with the one, sadly, to which we have to get used to, say, the civilized time. But now only I was talking. There is even a customer who has ordered a watch without hands. Yes, I've seen that on the internet too, and immediately thought, I'll do that as well. But then I wasn't brave enough. I need the normal boring time after all. A colleague has a further question, which is quite philosophical. How do you see the future of watchmaking, not only at Oxen Junior, but in general? As there are various developments. As you said earlier, ETA is restricting the delivery of movements. So there are movement manufacturers popping up everywhere. Oris now makes its own engines. That's one development now, but these are only the basic movements. And then there is a lot of crazy watches that cost millions, but are also bought. I was recently at Jacob and Co's website. There are some 40, 50 watches to choose from that cost each millions. There are customers for this, obviously, too. And in between there is this huge range of customers. What is your expectation how this will develop as a market in the next, say, 10 to 20 years? I have no idea. But one thing for sure is that after the quartz crisis, where Swiss watchmakers wanted to improve the accuracy of their wristwatches and mechanical watches, and then were overtaken by quartz, so the mechanical watch became obsolete in principle. It has recovered insofar as obviously mechanics is something fascinating, so much more fascinating than quartz. Just as I don't understand electricity, but wheels that turn. Wheels that turn, I prefer to having something electric. Yes, it's understandable and tangible. Yes, exactly. What happens when electricity flows, you do suddenly have energy. You can, of course, somehow explain it physically, but you still can't really imagine how it works. The tangible understanding of the process with the help of the tangible that you can achieve with a watch. Well, it's a large clock, a pendulum clock, for example, or a small watch, where you can open the movement and look at it. That places. You can see something happening, and it's entertaining, and it's simply fascinating that something like this is possible. And you can like it similar to a piece of jewelry, and the watch has actually turned into a piece of jewelry. It has transformed in a positive sense into jewelry until, say, some years after 2000, and then it got back a bit boring because people didn't come up with any more clever ideas. And meanwhile, it's become a bit boring in this industry. Nevertheless, they are pieces of jewelry and therefore will not perish because already among the Neanderthals, jewelry was worn, quasi something unnecessary. Yes, right, absolutely. And so obviously, there is a human need, like eating bread. So it is an existential need, like eating bread, that one can distinguish from another. That is a social effect. This language you have with it, you talk with such things, which is the basis for living at all, so that one person can recognize the other, so that we can deal with each other, after all. And this is why I think because the watch works in this area, it's such a means of communication. At the same time, it's also a piece of jewelry. It pleases you. The mechanical watch that is, the electronic ones will have to be discarded after a while, but the mechanical ones have a longer half-life until they don't work anymore. That is why it should survive. Of course, with up and down, you can see it also now goes down again. As soon as you start saving at luxury, there are also people who save on buying watches. This is clear. There is less turnover then. But to perish, like back then in the quartz crisis, that will certainly not happen anymore. That's an interesting aspect. Not only the adornment, but also the communication effect. Absolute. That is more a topic where I feel at home, communication. And that is indeed the case. Group membership, you differentiate from the others. And I don't mean the posers here. Yes, and this is essentially important because that gives you the attitude to life. And the watch belongs to it. Yes, I see it the same way. Many people who don't deal with it immediately think of the Rolex Submariner that the bouncer in Frankfurt wears to say, I made a lot of money. 
but that is only a very small partial aspect. The main effect is actually the social group affiliation. I admit that I also wear an Oxen Junior on my wrist because I... I don't necessarily want to show off, but because I want to communicate that I'm interested in these things, that I find something like that exciting, that perhaps I understand something like that. Perhaps I want to show that I'm smart enough to understand the principle, so to speak. The details I will not understand in a hundred years, but to understand the principle. That's a very interesting point, this, this communication aspect. Yeah. That's why I don't call it jewelry. But when I have to justify the watch to my wife, I say, that's art. <laughs> Just like others hang a Modigliani on the wall for a million. I buy a watch instead. And it won't have to stay in an air-conditioned room. I can wear it every day at work. That's no problem. <laughs> yes, for me, it's simply art. Do you have any other watches? Do you also collect watches? So, besides your own? Well, I simply have some of my prototypes. Yes, so these are your own. I mean, do you have any other? Actually, I only wore the last prototype, or my favorite watch, or the new prototypes, that I have to try out again. I really only wear my own watches. Having said that, I bought some watches in the market, but not really in the interest to collect them, but to study them instead. Okay. What solutions do they have in them? Because there was a time in the 1940s and 50s where they built calendar watches, which were a bit strange, and I wanted to know what was behind it. So I bought them. What was that, for example, if I may ask? And some of them are still with me. So these are objects of study. They did lead to me having a few watches, but it really isn't a collection. It's a collection of things that are of interest to me and have a purpose. Right, not the ones I buy to wear at the opera, like I purchase a golden watch for the opera night, but you bought them to understand them. Yes, exactly. And what you have found there is then indirectly in today's watches. Yes, exactly. Or, as we have just learned, in the watches which will, after n years of delay, will come to the market sometime. <laughs> yes, maybe. Well, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Well, I have the impression that more and more people are dealing with the topic Oxen Junior. So I'm sitting here now because I'm doing this interview for Fifth Wrist Radio. And because of this, I dived more into the community. And there are a lot of people who not only deal with it, but who also buy these watches. <laughs> Maybe the last question to ask, maybe a little bit a difficult question. What will your legacy be? What do you want your legacy to be? Is there anything you want to leave to the next generation at some point? Or is it already there anyway? Everything I've made is known. Either it is patented, the patents can be looked up, and you can also learn from it. If you find that I have found good solutions, uh, you could use that as a query. Then you can reuse it in another form. If other people see that I've done something useful, then that's okay. Then I think it's good and the rest is open source anyway. Then you can just build it. Open source because it's not patented. What's not patented is available. Again, an approach I've never heard before in this industry, or actually in most other industries. Most people say, this is my thing, I want to keep everything for myself, closed shop. This is not the case at all, on the contrary. I mean, it is an honor if someone thinks uh, that I've done something well and that they can do it better. And then somehow he develops it further, to better things. And then I have the inspiration to give that a good thing and something good comes out. Fascinating. One more question, because I kind of want to complete the timeline out of interest. You have a doctorate in physics and philosophy. Theoretical physics, like history and the philosophy of natural sciences. Right, and you habilitated in? I habilitated at ETH, which is a technical university in Zurich, in Department 12, which was the culture department, the education department for ETH. And in this field, I received a Vini Legendi in history for pre-industrial technology archaeology. So I was a specialist in technology history and physics history up to the 19th century. <laughs> Insane. And all that has influenced watchmaking in the end. Yes, what I did during my studies has covered that. Hmm, okay. Mark, did I forget a question? Maybe I want to add from the commercial side that this year two new products will be launched and available next year. You can be pleased, Klaus. The Settimana will be launched in a limited edition with modern colors, which your daughter-in-law selected, Ludwig. 
She's a communication designer. Yes, I'm very curious about that too. My wife is an architect and is always involved in colors and also helped to design my watch because that's not my expertise. Next to that, we will launch a perpetual calendar based on the UN 320. This will be called Calendario Centiani or CCA. Ludwig, could you tell us something about it? Fasciniert haben mich immer die Kalender. So I was always fascinated by calendars because they are difficult to find the construction solution, especially if you want to work with only a few parts. It always looks a bit simpler and uses less parts, but in fact, it is much more complex because individual parts have to perform several tasks at the same time. So that's what you call multitasking. Well, that doesn't exist in humans, but parts can multitask by doing two things at once if you design them right. Okay. But then it's one part instead of five or six that have done these tasks before. It looks easy, but the work behind the construction solution is really a lot more. And you have to go backwards and forwards and into a lot of dead ends. In any case, the complexity is in the construction itself and not number of parts. Right, of course. And there I've developed calendars and all possibilities. One of them is the date clock, which simply shows the date, where you have to readjust every month for 30 days. Then you can correct the months. Then there is this annual calendar, which shows the calendar correctly within a year. Then there is the perpetual calendar that corrects the 28th and 29th, and that lasts 100 years. Therefore, Caldarius sent Ani. That is the 100-year calendar, because after 100 years, you have to finally correct it. But the two perpetual calendars, the existing one and the new one, how are they different? Not in the display. They both correct the leap years, and the February until the year 2100, where they have to be adjusted. But how are the two calendars different then? Which ones? The new and the existing one. The construction is construction's actually the same. The perpetual calendar on the 118 and the 320 is constructed the same. Maybe the design is a little new, a little sportier. Okay, yeah. And then, of course, I developed a Gregorian calendar, but it doesn't come on the market. I did that only for myself. Then I just have this carnival watch, this really big computus. And for us personally, I've made a four-year watch. They correct February the 28th, but every four years, the 29th has to be corrected by hand. So a kind of mixture of the annual and the perpetual calendar. This is the four-year calendar. But this doesn't really exist. Hmm, okay. Again, I kind of find that interesting. But I'm certainly not the market. The perpetual calendar will be exciting, the new one. The case is similar, isn't it? The case is like the 320. Yes, as you said before, and that completes the cycle. Yes, just like the day and night watch. My case, so to say. So for the small stylistic features. Just right. Now that I have it on my wrist, I begin to notice the differences. I didn't realize that before. And when I wore it, I saw that the lugs are ever so slightly different from my moon face. And that's the great thing about it. They all follow the same design philosophy, but differ in detail. As we have now learned, the details are influenced by the movements. Yes. So, it took us just under an hour now. I think that's right. Yes. If you don't have anything more to add, okay. I can only say thank you for speaking to us. Thanks for speaking with me. So, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. We've translated this, and so that's why it may not sound like it was in English and natural language, but we've tried to be as faithful as possible to what was originally said. And uh, when you take one language and translate into another language, the way various things are said are not always quite the same. Stay on time. And thanks for listening. If you liked it, please follow the podcast and leave a review. If you haven't done yet, go to fifthwrist.com and write your own watch review. It's fun and it helps others in the watch community. You can also become a member of our Slack group if you like. Just write us an email to contact at fifthwrist.com. And Instagram. Follow Fifth Wrist and of course those who contributed to this episode and who are listed in the podcast notes of this episode. My name is Klaus, also known as Taper underscore FFM, T A P I R underscore FFM. The time is gone, the song is over. Thought I'd something more to say. Bye for now, take care and stay safe.